Stone, how you doing? I'm glad you're here this morning that we get to worship. Our God is faithful, amen. Let's declare that today. Come on, let's sing. We have this confidence in Jesus. His blood has brought us into freedom. There is no other that can save.
Church, I wanna invite you to stay in this moment of worship with me for just a second. One of the things I love most about our God is that we worship him as a God who not only has done amazing things, but is doing amazing things, amen? 
And we just want to share something that happened yesterday. We get to partner with God in what He's doing. And yesterday, here at Cornerstone, we had an event called City Serve. Who was part of City Serve? If you see people with City Serve t-shirts on, make sure you say thank you to them. Here's some quick stats for you. We had over 540 volunteers go and serve our city. Isn't that amazing? So good. We're proud of you, church. And here's what that added up to. That's over 1,200 volunteer hours represented. And here's the big impact. Are you ready? That's over 68,000 people who were impacted as a result of our people serving. Can we just praise God for that? So good. Thank you for being a generous church who moves towards people. Cornerstone, you can grab a seat. We are so glad that you're with us. If we haven't met, my name's Joel. I get the privilege of serving as our young adults pastor here, working with our 20-somethings and our college students. I wanna start by giving a special shout out to anyone in the room who might be new with us. Listen, we know it's a big deal to come to a place you've never been before and show up to church, maybe for the first time, by yourself. And so we wanna say thank you for being here. We wanna make this feel like home for you. And so a couple ways that we can invite you to do that. The first one is if you take out your phone and text the word NEW to 21999, we'll just send you some info all about what God's doing here in our church. The other option is as you leave service today, if you go through the lobby and look to the left, you're gonna see a new here, start here area with some really, really friendly volunteers who would love to meet you, learn your name, and give you a gift just to say thank you for being a guest with us today. So thanks for being here. I wanna to talk to the parents for just a second. We have a couple really exciting things that I want you to know about and make sure you have on your calendar. So the first one is Kids Camp. Kids Camp is the first week in June. This is for your four-year-old all the way through your fourth grader. Parents, this is an entire week where your kids are gonna go and not only have fun, not only make memories, but they're gonna make memories that revolve around Jesus, okay? And here's the thing, it's only $50 for the entire week. Parents, I don't know if you're hearing me, $50 for your kids to go have an entire week. So make sure you register them for that. Again, it's the first week in June, only $50. You can text CAMP with a K, that's right, with a K to 21999 to get registered for that. Parents, stay with me. This one's for the dads in the room. So dads, lean in. Moms, if they're not paying attention, give them a little nudge this morning. We have our daddy-daughter dance coming up on May 3rd. This is hosted by our CS Men's Ministry, and it's just a really fun night where dads, you get to celebrate this beautiful relationship that God's given you with your daughter. Granddads, bring your granddaughters. Dads, bring your daughters May 3rd at 6 p.m. We want to give you a space to just celebrate and lean into that relationship that's so, so special. So you can text the word DANCE to 21999 to register or get more info on that. Church, we're in the second week of this series where we're talking about dating and what it looks like to date in a way that honors God both before marriage and after you step into marriage. And so it's been incredible, but here's, here's our heart as a church staff. We didn't wanna just throw information at you. We actually wanted to give you resources that would be practically helpful and even give you opportunities to step into what you're learning. And so mark your calendars. April 26th, right here at Cornerstone, we're hosting something that's appropriately named Date Night. Date Night, and this is for you regardless of your relational status, whether you're single and looking for a place to have your first date, like, hey, bring your boo thing and get them here. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Or maybe you're married, and this is a great opportunity for you to show your spouse that you're listening and applying what you're learning. Ask them on a date. Bring them to date night here, April 26th. We're gonna have a lot of fun elements and clean comedy from Andrew Stanley. It's gonna be a great night. You can register for that by texting date night, all one word, to 21999. Church, we're so grateful for the way that you give faithfully, the way that you are generous with what God has entrusted to you. And so thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. If you haven't yet stepped into a journey of giving here at Cornerstone, we make it super simple. Today, you can just text GIVE to 21999. And while you're thinking about and praying about where God might be nudging your heart to give and contribute to what he's doing, we wanna remind you we're in a really special campaign to serve India. 
where we're raising money to help pay for medical expenses and build a hospital and some incredible things. So would you lean in and watch this video to learn more? In the rural village in central India, there is no public transportation. No cars, no bikes, no motorcycles. The closest bus stop outside the village is 20 miles away, on foot. We have been here in ministry for 22 years, and I have never felt every inch of those 20 miles until my family suddenly became sick. As my family was getting better, my two-year-old son was getting sicker by the day. Here in our village, we have no clinics, no urgent care, and no transportation to get him the simple medicine he needed to lower his fever. Days went by. We tried whatever we could, but his fever continued. As I looked at my boy, I knew I had to do whatever I could to get him to the hospital for medicine. I left. I picked him up and began walking. Without transportation, I had no other option. His fever kept persisting. We kept going. This was my only way to get him the medicine needed for his fever. On we went, miles through rural India, step by step, carrying my son. Looking at him suffer, I started crying out to God, Why did you send us here? But I kept walking, step by step, one foot in front of the other begging God to heal my son. As we were on the journey, walking to get him to the hospital, my son died in my arms. That day, I began carrying my son to find healing. I ended the day carrying my son to be buried. Are you new to Cornerstone? Maybe you've been here a little while, but you've been hiding in the back. We are so excited that you're joining our Cornerstone family. We want to meet you. Our team is super pumped to be hosting a New Here Night. New Here Night. New Here Night. New Here Night. We want to get to know you. You got to come. You got to be here. We would love to hang out with you guys. Come meet other people just like you. While you're here, you can ask all the questions you've been wondering about Cornerstone. Like, where are the donuts? Why is there slime on the children's building? Is there a community for people my age? Can you be on the worship team if you're really good at lip syncing? We have some amazing desserts. We have coffee. Cookies! Come join us. We want to get to know you. Grab a dessert and let's hang. We'll see you there. I feel like God's telling me that you should go on a date with me. That is so bad. <laughs> Read that and tell me what you think. <laughs> hey, I'm Will. God's will for you. And then in quotes, helps if your name's actually Will. <laughs> I believe one of my ribs belongs to you. That's a good one. That's a good one. Hey! Good to see you, Cornerstone. All right. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 today. Hebrews chapter 11, if you're new to the Jesus conversation, Hebrews chapter 11 is affectionately known as the faith chapter of the Bible. Faith is one of those like big kind of $5 churchy words that we use a little bit in different contexts. We don't really know what it means. You can have faith that Santa Claus exists. You can have faith that the government's going to protect you. You can have faith the apocalypse is coming. There's a lot of stuff in the realm of faith. But in a biblical worldview, faith is a really simple explanation. It, it asks this question. Do you believe that God is going to do what he said he's going to do? You don't need to make it too much bigger. You don't make the inquiry too inflated. It's, it's a simple question. Do you believe that God is going to do what he said he's going to do? 
And you might be asking, how is this pertinent to a dating conversation? Great question. The, the answer to that is, if you were to scour the plains of culture, to read in every GQ magazine and every popular culture article about dating, and you went to Men's Health and you went to Women's D Day, <laughs> is that a magazine? No one knows. Good housekeeping. <laughs> It turns out I don't know very many magazines. But if you ask all of them, um, who should I be looking for in a, in a dating relationship? Who, who should I be looking for to potentially journey with in life and grab hands with and execute the rest of my life together? Who should I be looking for? The advice that they would give you, I bet a lot of those things would overlap with one another. Find someone taller than you. Find someone with common interests. Find someone with a deep bank account. Find someone who, right? All these other ideas. And What's funny is when they finish their list, if you said, give me six things that I should be looking for in a dating relationship, and you allowed culture to speak into that, which is where most of us, that's the white noise we hear every day, right? If you're in our world for a week, you spend 167 hours in culture and one hour a week in church. And so what you're, what's dripped in and what is thrown at us in waves is cultural ideas on dating, cultural ideas on marriage, cultural ideas on expectations. But I would guess that if you panned all those things, you would not find anything that we're going to talk about today in terms of who should I be looking for and someone to potentially have as a spouse. Why is faith important? Faith is important because if you've been following Jesus for longer than 10 minutes, here's what you're going to find. Following Jesus is counterintuitive the things that God calls you to do is counterintuitive to life. That's why the Bible is more than one page long. If everything about following God, about life and finances and dating and marriage, it was all naturally intuitive to us. It just made sense. It was our second nature. It was our knee-jerk reaction. The Bible would be one page long and it would say, you know, just do what you do. Why is it so long? Why is it so long then? Because the word of God follows. Here's what Galatians says. The spirit of God wants what's contrary to our flesh, and our flesh wants what's contrary to their spirit. The great church fathers use these terms over and over again. If you want to follow Christ, you must mortify. You must kill the flesh. Over, We have to get rid of our old way of thinking. Romans 12. If you want to follow Christ, you can't be conformed to this world's patterns. You need to metanoia, transform your mind and think a new way about things. I love that Cornerstone is doing a series on dating. And you might be sitting here going, why are we doing a series on dating? I'm married. Why are we doing a series on dating? I've been married for 34 years. Why are we doing a series on dating? I've sworn off dating. No matter where you find yourself, one thing that I can tell you from getting to go around to different churches is that Cornerstone is a church where people cross demographically, some date. The fact that you can do a dating series because there's people in your church that are still dating is amazing. The fact that you have people in every age and stage of life and we can lean in and help one another, but also this is another thing for all of us in this room. Dating, just like your walk with Jesus, a cultural expectation is that dating is supposed to be done in a vacuum. You find someone that you love and then you go... You go into your little space, you huddle up, you have your relationship together, and then when one of you breaks up, boom, you're back in church. You ever seen that before? When I was leading in high school ministry, all of a sudden a kid would drop off the map, and I was like, it's either club sports or they got a girlfriend. They got a girlfriend? Got it. We'll see them when this thing comes to an inevitable end. And we would, and then they would come back. And, and so one of the cultural expectations that Romans 12 talks about to change the pattern of this world is for us to know as a church, the people around us who are in dating relationships, who are searching for people to date, that we don't just go, well, that's their problem. If they're part of your church, they're your problem too. They're your loving family. And so we want to make sure that we, as a whole group of people, as a body of Christ, as believers are coming together because your dating relationships are absolutely personal, but they're not supposed to be private. Did you know that your, your walk with God is also personal, but it's actually not meant to be private? This is where culture has seeped into the church to tell us that when we start walking with God, it's my personal relationship with Jesus. You're right. But the idea that someone else can't speak into it and look into it absolutely neglects the whole point of the church. We're supposed to be there for each other, to give wisdom and guidance and understanding. And as we hear these ideas that are so counterintuitive and countercultural, they can seem sometimes counterproductive. 
as if God wants to take away some measure or some level of joy in our life. And in Hebrews chapter 11, there's this list of heroes from scripture, and we know them by name, a lot of us, even if you're not part of the Jesus conversation, if you're just here checking out our, or why is the church doing something on dating? What does God know about dating? Maybe that's the question that you're asking. But some of these stories, right, the the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us there's a man named Noah who built an ark in Yuma, Arizona. Not really, but similar. No precipitation. Imagine building a giant ark in Yuma and being like, because of storms are coming, right? Everyone would be like, (laughs) what are you smoking, right? You wouldn't know what to do with that guy. And then the Bible commends him. He says, with great faith, Noah built an ark in a place where it never rains. With great faith, a man named Moses put his rod into the ocean and God put a highway in the middle of a sea. By faith, a prostitute named Rahab lied to a couple of temple guards or a couple of uh, guards that were coming to to kill part of God's people and she lied about where they were and she's commended. A, 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 A lying prostitute makes it in the hall of faith. There's hope for all of us, right? And all of them were commended for this one idea. Here's what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, and without faith, what's faith? It's trusting God enough to do what he said he's going to do. That's it. Because these people trusted God enough to do what he said he's going to do, without that, you would never be able to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe both that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There's a little bit of a litmus test I think I'd like you to do, which is one that I've done throughout my whole life, and probably only recently, in the past decade or so, has this switched for me. How many of us have this idea that God is truly honored in our life when we go, I see the world having fun, I see the world's contentment, I see the world's riches, I see the fun my friends are having, I see the drunken binges, I see all these things, and if I avoid all fun and all joy and all pleasure, then God's going to go, yeah, I like that. You isolated, sulking, overly manipulative fool. I love this. You don't, right? That if we come to church and You know, someone in church is like excited and smiling. We're like, you've missed the point. We don't smile at church, right? Here's something that I I think getting to, uh, as you're teaching the scriptures, what you'll find is this. And and, and this is part of what Lynn talked about last week. He made up a word called mahealthy, spiritually mature and emotionally healthy. He talked about introspection. Before we're ready to date, we have to look in the mirror and go, am I, am I going to wreck someone if I enter a relationship with someone? Am I ready to steward someone else's heart in the middle of this? Culture says, for sure, give it a shot, see what happens. And Lynn said, there's a real big idea about looking and examining self before we get into anything. But here's, here's a question I want to ask you. Maybe it's a point I want to make more than a question. There is not a single book of the Bible, not a single chapter of the Bible, not a single verse, not a single word, not a single thought, not a single command, not a single precept, not a single letter, not a, not a single little dot above an eye of any letter of the Bible. Not one thing in the Bible is meant to take away an ounce of your joy as a human being. Not one. Conversely, did you know that every single book and every single chapter and every single verse and every single word and every single dot over every single I is meant for one thing and one thing only, that you would come to a full knowledge, John 17, of God and who his son is and that by believing in him, John 10, 10, you would have life, abundant, joyful life in his name. Did you know that that's true? Th- this is why this is important. If you don't think that that's true, if you think that God is calling us all to be like a monastic hermit in a cave going, I've never smiled before, and God's like, thank God, this is so, well, thank me, this is fantastic. Look, he's a hermit. He doesn't talk to people. He hates his life. This is the kind of follower I'm looking for. Read the Bible. Over and over again, he says, I'm here for your joy. I'm here that your joy may be in me, John 16, and that your joy may be complete. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice, Paul writes. And then he starts talking about, do you know that in all things, no matter what happens, we rejoice even in our sufferings, for suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope is necessary for faith in Christ Jesus. God is not here that your joy would be limited, but that it would be complete. Now, Why is that important in a dating context? 
Because if you look at the scriptures and what it says about relationships and marriage and love and all these things, here's the first thing you're going to find. It says nothing about dating. Let me quote to you every verse in the Bible about dating. Are you ready? That was it. Okay, there's not one. Why? Because it's a new concept. 1896 is when the term dating was actually coined. There was a guy named George Aid, and he's writing for the Chicago Record. And so if, if my arms stretched out of the entirety of human history, and this is like Adam and Eve, like the pointer of my middle finger on my left hand, this is Adam and Eve, and my head is like the crucifixion of Jesus, then this is like present time. Dating started like right here. It's brand new. So almost like a baby deer, culture's trying to figure out, how do we walk like this? This is goofy. From arranged marriages to courtship to the idea of the bride price, this was culture even in the world today. It's not just a new phenomenon timeline. It's a new phenomenon culturally. There's still places around the world that look at us dating and go, this is goofy. So you, just like you go to the supermarket, you do that with people too. You walk around and you go, no, no, no. Like duck, duck, goose, no. Goose, right? That failed. New duck, new duck, new goose, new goose. New go- and then it is kind of a goofy idea. How do we possibly expect to scour and flip right and swipe left and hinge and t- tinder and bumble and things, right? And think that we don't start seeing people as products, things to be used rather than people to be loved. And as we've gotten better at dating, we've gotten worse at marriage. Is that a weird concept? <laughs> And every way that culture progresses, look, this is the new way of doing things. This is a new way when you find, if you're willing to believe this, first and foremost, we recognize the Bible says nothing explicitly about dating, but the Bible is full of wisdom and prudence and judiciousness that can be applied in all situations. It does talk about how we relate to one another. It does talk about governance in our life. It does talk about submission and understanding and what the wise do and what the foolish do. This is important in a dating conversation. Why do you need to believe that God is for you before you're willing to come and hear a conversation on dating? Because he is going to ask you to date in a counterintuitive way. Just like he asks you to do your finances in a counterintuitive way. If you want to be generous, give your money away. If you want to be blessed, don't store up things for yourself here where moth and rust destroy. If He's got an upside down kingdom. It reminds me, the other day my kids are playing baseball in the backyard. I've got five kids. That's entirely too many. I know, okay, fine, we're over it. But the nine-year-old and the six-year-old are playing catch with a baseball and they've got their friends there and as they're playing, they're blaming each other for everything. Bad throw, bad catch. You couldn't hit the broad, broad side of a barn door. All that other jazz, right? You play ball like a girl. It got really intense. But in the middle of that, Peyton comes up to me and he's like, dad, everyone's just picking on each other. I don't like it. It's no fun. And I said, Peyton, I want you to do something. You know that I love you. And you know that I've been through a little bit more in life than you. Not a lot more, but a little bit more. You know. Here's what I want you to do. The next time Brady throws the ball clean over your head and you reach for it and you miss it, and it's clearly his fault, I want you to say, my bad, should have caught that. He's like, but it's not mine. I'm like, shh, 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 shh. You came and asked me what you should do. I've been here before. I've played sports my whole life. Just say, my bad, and watch the culture change. So he goes out there. Brady throws it clean over his head, and Peyton goes, my bad, I should have caught that. And then compulsively, as if something was speaking through him, my son Brady goes, no, it was a bad throw. My bad. And like the kid in the outfield's like, actually, my bad. You know what I mean? It was like, it's like this symphony of responsibility started. And Peyton looks over at me, and I'm kind of like, I know. Isn't it weird, right? If you're on a football field, and you catch a touchdown, and you go, yeah, look at me. Everyone goes, that guy's the worst, right? But if you catch the ball, you hand it to the ref, and you walk off, people go, that's cool. That's cool. There's things that we do that are counterintuitive. The Bible is full of counterintuition. So if you're willing to submit and go, all right, God, take the keys to my life. Teach me how to date. I promise you, if you try to square that with culture, it ain't going to work. The question that we want to ask today is if God is the bouncer of your heart. Think about a bouncer at a club, right? Out. Nope. Move on. Nope. You're not coming in. Nope. Sorry, no access. Yes, you may come in. No. Who's the bouncer in your dating relationships? Who sits at the door of your heart and throws people out and lets people in? beyond that, what's the criteria you've given that bouncer to throw people out and let people in? And what if 
And you have to believe, you have to have faith. You have to trust that God's re- God rewards those who earnestly seek him. You have to believe that God's gonna do what he said he's gonna do. What if you said, all right, you hand him the keys, you bounce who you want, you let in who you want. You tell me what I should be looking for, first and foremost, in someone that I, w- that I would wanna date to join my life together with. I wanna give you guys a few of those principles today that are found in scripture. And while it doesn't explicitly talk about a dating relationship, we can certainly take these ideas. Again, when George Aid in 1896 in the, in the Chicago record is talking about dating, dating was originally seen as a form of prostitution. Isn't that weird? Because his buddy Artie was engaged to this woman and she said, I'm gonna go to the local bar and I'm gonna let anyone who wants to buy me a drink and see if they'd be a proper suitor for me. The police didn't know what to do with her. So in the article, he says, all of a sudden, Artie's fiance was filling up all her dates with other men. That's where the word date comes from. It comes from a basically jargon, antithetical jargon against this woman who was Artie's girlfriend who said, from here on out, anyone can fill up my dates, not just this guy. And so dating was born. So we would expect anachronistically, the Bible can't talk about dating, just like it wouldn't talk about screen time on an iPad or how to FaceTime appropriately. It wasn't part of their culture. But we want to derive these principles from the text that we can apply in our dating relationships. Here's the first one. It goes in a little bit of an acrostic that spells out the word flower because it's adorable, okay? The first one is this. If God is the bouncer of your life, the first question he's going to ask anyone who wants to enter the doors to date you is this. Are they fully surrendered to Jesus? Okay? This is what's hard. I, got, I had a very unique situation in my life where I dated when I was 18, 19, 20 years old in that era, and I married my college sweetheart named Paige. We were married for 10 years. We had five kids. She passed away in 2021. Then I'm a 32-year-old guy with five kids, and I'm entering into a dating season again, right? We, ended up, we got married actually six months ago, my wife and I, Carolyn, so we're now, that, I'm done with dating. <laughs> Forever, maybe. But as such, I remember looking at my list from when I was like 20. Did any of y'all have a list? Ladies, your list? He's got to be taller than me. That's necessary. Hopefully he's also a believer. What did you just say? (laughs) He's got to be taller or hot and and into crocheting. And if he's a believer, that'd be great. It's like icing on the cake. But if you give God the list and go, what are you looking for? I think the first question he's going to ask is, is that person fully surrendered to Jesus? Here's what's difficult. When you ask someone, are you a Christian, more than 70% of Americans would consider themselves Christians. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe that if you asked God what percentage of Americans are Christian, he would say 70%? And his opinion is the only one that matters, right? (laughs) He gets to make that call. And so it goes beyond just saying, so are you religious? Yes, I am. But that's typically, if a guy's tall and hot or if the girl, she's got it going on and everything, we go, are you kind of spiritual at all? Yes, we'll, we'll take that as a yes. Good, you're in. The first question is, are they fully surrendered to Jesus? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's what Matthew 16 tells us. Jesus says, if anyone is truly a follower of me, a disciple, a mathetas, they must be self-deniers, must deny themselves, take up their cross, be ready to die for their faith and follow me. That's a very different standard than, are you a Christian? Are you, are you, do you deny yourself on the cross of Christ? Are you ready to die for the, your belief that you have in him? And do you follow him every single day? That's a very different standard than, do you consider yourself a cultural Christian? And as the, the, the wise people in this room who might be further into their dating or into their marriage relationships, they will tell you this is one of the key ways that Satan grips certain people is to convince them that they're Christians without ever asking the question, what does that mean? What does it mean when we call ourselves that? So first thing is, are we fully surrendered to Jesus? The second thing is, do they have a loving community of believers around them? You might think this isn't very important because your boyfriend's a lone wolf, right? Right? It's so hot. He just does his own thing. He plays by no one's rules. That's fantastic. Until you're married and you go, hey, this wasn't cool. And he goes, I play by my own rules. Then it's not so cool. That's not so cool now. Why? Because what you'll find in marriage, at least in my marriage, and I'm being vulnerable, is sometimes you disagree with each other. Have you been there? 
We're the only one? That was supposed to be a joke, but I'm getting concerned there's a problem with my marriage. Okay. But when we get in conflict, I will go to my group of guys and go, here's what's going on. Here's where I lost my temper a little bit. Here's where I need to change some of these ideas. Here's where I asked a question, but I did it a little bit cynically, so it would kind of barb a little bit, and I know I shouldn't have done that. She goes to her group of girlfriends, and here's what's going on. Here's what we're going through. I need a group of friends and be confident that my wife has a group of friends that when I go, here's what I do, the guys are going to go, you get your butt over there. You repent for what you've done. You apologize to your wife, and you make it right. And I go, I know you're right, but I was looking for you to say, let's go get drunk and do something different. But, all right. And you walk back over. And I need confidence that when she goes to her circle, because there's a point at which we're not going to agree about everything, that when she goes over here, they're going to go, it is time for you to forgive your husband, to go back and to reconcile, which is what we've been given, the Bible tells us, the ministry of reconciliation. This is your responsibility. You said come hell or high water and sickness and in hell for better or for worse. This is worse. Go back to your man. This is the covenant that you made. Get back over there and forgive one another. And so they push us back towards each other. If it doesn't matter to you whether or not they're involved in a community of believers, they're not serving in a church, they're not involved in, in a group that's holding them accountable, that's setting them to a biblical standard, it might not be important to you now, but when you have kids and you have this bifurcation in your marriage and there's infidelity and everything else is happening, what you're going to find is you're going to be screaming out for help and no one's going to respond. There's no one there that's going to take your side and say, you go reconcile with your spouse. A loving community of believers seems essential. Here's what the New Testament tells us. 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Why would a text begin with the phrase, do not be deceived? Because you and I are likely to be deceived. Otherwise, why would you say it, right? Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. They would be fully, if, if Jesus is the bouncer of your life, they'd be fully surrendered to him. They'd have a loving community of believers. And, and here's what you understand. If you're a boss in here, if you're a CEO, or you do the hiring your chief of staff or whatever you're doing, and you're hiring people, when I meet you face-to-face -face for your interview, that calculates for me about a two or three out of 10. It might tell me if we've got chemistry working on a team together. It might be powerful in some cases, but I, you're in an interview, when I read your resume, that doesn't help me too much more. Do you want to know what's so powerful? References. What do people say about we, you when you're not in the room? What do people who have worked with you historically have to say? That's why a loving community of believers is so important because you also get other people speaking into it and saying, here's one thing I'd be cautious of. Here's one thing I would pay attention to. Third one, oh, are they open to growth and humility? Are they open to growth and humility? Are they willing to be shaped Timothy Keller writes a book called The Meaning of Marriage. And in The Meaning of Marriage, he does a Google talk on it. Google invites him. It's such a counter-cultural book that they go, tell us more about the meaning of marriage. And they do an open Q&A. And one of the people in the, in the audience asks, what's the number one thing I should look for in a mate? And he goes, well, from a non-scriptural point of view, from a non-biblical point of view, if you want me to speak as a secularist, I would say a good chunk of marble willing to be sculpted. A good chunk of marble but willing to be sculpted, willing to be shaped, willing to be challenged, willing to learn, willing to adjust your thinking, open to growth and humility. Someone who's not a learner is gonna be a terrible lover. Someone who's not a learner is gonna be a really difficult life partner because they're gonna go, well, I've learned how to do things my own way and my way is the best way. If they're not a student of you, if they're not willing to become a student of marriage and a student of growth and a student of you and a student of relationship and a student of parenting and a student of everything in life, be careful. The Bible puts humility at the top of the character chart. Are they open to growth and humility? How do you find out if they're open to growth and humility? You start asking them questions about things they need to work on and how they're adopting that and how they're changing those things. Are they open to growth and humility? W stands for wisdom and guidance from mentors. This is a very, as far as culture is concerned, this has been lost for this day and age. The idea of having someone older than you speak into your life. The book of Titus talks about this. The older women should speak into the, the lives of the younger women. The, the scripture seems to indicate that discipleship isn't complete until you have someone who's discipling you and you have someone that you're discipling. The discipleship circle isn't complete until I both have someone that disciples me and I have someone else that I'm discipling. 
Wisdom and mentors, the reason this is so important throughout the text, what we find out, is why is it important for you to have someone in your life who's older, wiser, more spiritually healthy than you are? One of the key ingredients to that is that you can't care in a mentor whether or not they're friends with you or not. My mentor, his name is Dr. Ebel. He's 76 years old. So when he tells me something I need to hear, and I say, that's it, we're not friends, he says, we never were. He's not going, oh no, one less 35-year-old friend, what am I going to do? He, he has carte blanche permission to say the difficult things in my life, and I'll listen to him because he doesn't have a dog in the fight. He's not chasing after the same girls that I would be going after if I were dating. He's, he, he, has, he has no, any reason except for the truth and the love that he has for me to tell me something difficult to hear. So for all of us who say, well, I've got a great marriage, this dating season has nothing to do with me, here's where the question comes in. Is there anyone whose life you're pouring into who's dating? Who are you speaking into? So for Carolyn and I, it's finding an older couple that's further along in marriage, and we're saying, show us what we don't see. Are they, do they have wisdom and guidance from mentors? E, are they entirely submissive to Scripture? If 70% of Americans say that they're Christians, you simply ask them this question. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. If someone says they're a Christian and then you say, well, when it comes to difficult things in life, cultural conflicts, faith, morality, ethics, what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, is the Bible the final authority? In other words, is the Bible perfect? Is it God's holy word, inerrant? Is it perfect in everything that it says? Is it inerrant in its original transmission? Is the Bible the final authority of faith and morality for you? Less than 20% of Americans say yes. See how different that is? When you ask someone, are you a Christian? They can say whatever they want to say. Then you say, do you believe the Bible is the final authoritative word on all matters of faith and morality? The majority of the Christians at that, Christians at that point would say, no, I don't think that. But it's one of the core things we believe. We believe that someone is saved, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, by grace, through faith, in Christ, revealed through Scripture alone, to God's glory alone. What it means to be a Christian is that you lean in and you say, I am entirely submissive to Scripture. Why? Because in the same thing as before, if you're not, and I say, well, listen, this is, what it said, this is what it looks like to be married. This is what it looks like to honor one another. Ephesians chapter 5, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. This is our common rule book. This is what it means to be married. This is how we should treat each other. This is how we should raise our kids in the Lord. This is what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. The problem is, if you aren't both entirely submissive to Scripture, you're going to, like a football referee, bring in your whole playbook into someone else's world, and they're playing basketball. You know how difficult it is to try to judge a basketball game with football rules? Or vice versa? If you go, this is our rule book, and they say, no, 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 this is my rule book, then you don't really have a rule book. It has to be a commonly agreed upon authoritative ultimate source. Are they entirely submissive to Scripture? Why? Psalm 1 says this, Blessed are those who don't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but they delight. That means they meditate, they think on, they process the word of the Lord. Those people are like trees transplanted by streams and waters of God's mercy. They yield their fruit in season. Everything they does prospers and their leaf never withers. This is the importance of the word of God. Don't let someone hoodwink you by calling themselves spiritual. You just have to ask, is the Bible the final rule of authority and faith in your life? Are they entirely submissive to Scripture? And lastly, are they relentlessly committed to protection? Relentlessly committed to protection. What do I mean by protection? I mean, for most of us, most people are not going to date the person that they marry. Now, most people's marriage comes from dating, but most people that you ask, how many people did you date before you dated the person that you married? Most people's list isn't zero. Which means that the majority of dating relationships that we experience, we're actually stewarding someone else's future spouse. Do you love the person that you're dating enough to recognize they will probably not be yours long term? There's a process that we go through in dating. It starts with what Lynn talked about last week, introspection. And then exploration. And then evaluation and then consummation, okay? That's marriage. Introspection, now we're getting into 
Who should we be exploring for? And then when you find someone, you should go through a process of evaluation. Is this the right person for me? Is this what I should be doing? Is this the type of person that I want to be connected to? Some of these high tail signs that this is not what you should be looking for is if someone isn't committed to protecting not just you and your future marriage, whoever that might be too, but what are their eyes observing? What's their relationship to internet content? Are they comparing you to other people? Are they constantly tearing you down so that you would never leave them? These are not protective principles. This is not what the scripture talks about when it means a man of above repute. This is not what it talks about when it talks about a woman in Proverbs 31 who the whole town looks at and says she is a highly praised woman. To protect someone means to protect every part of who they are. And Lynn talked about this last week. Mind, soul, body, and strength. Everything about who they are. And if you're not committed to protecting my daughter in every single aspect, my daughter's seven, but I think about this through this lens now of going, do you know whose daughter everyone in this room is? When you start looking at dating through the lens of, hi, I'd like to take your daughter out on a date, do things change? Certainly changes for me to go, just, I, yep, home by when? You got it, Absolutely. Don't, don't touch. Got it for sure. Yep, got it. The scripture says this. Until you're ready to enter into that covenant relationship, our men should treat the women in their society like sisters. So just a, it's a question for you, for anyone sitting here. Who sits at the door of our heart? Who do we allow to bounce people out? And who do we allow to let people enter in? The Bible doesn't say anything on dating. You're totally right. It has, it's full of principles. And it, it, it really treats dating not like a, like a recipe, like a cookie recipe, right? Cookie recipe, you're like a little bit of vanilla, right? Some of you in here, you're psychotic when you bake. You're like this, this, this. You make something, it's delicious, and you'll never make it again because you don't write it down. To you, food is art, for some of us, food is science, right? So you do the same thing every single time. But do you treat dating like a cookie recipe or do you treat it like disarming a bomb? When you're disarming a bomb, you don't go, ah, blue or red? I don't know, feeling blue. <laughs> I tried. Why is it important for us to see it a little bit more in the second rather than the first? Because here's what the scripture talks about when it comes to who we're choosing and who we're doing life alongside of. Are you ready for this? It is better for you to live in the corner of a roof of a house than with a contentious wife. You'd be better off in the elements on the roof in the corner than having to spend your whole life with a contentious woman. Gentlemen, say amen. Don't say amen. No, 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 that's bad. No, you shouldn't. No, you should all be going, not my wife, not my wife. I don't even understand that proverb, right, babe? That one doesn't, God's word is holy, but that one doesn't make sense to me. That's foreign, foreign concept. <laughs> 10 verses later, in the book of Proverbs, it is better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious wife are alike. You're like, okay, why all the women? Why is it Solomon the wise man who asked for wisdom from God and was given it in full is writing a book to his son. So as he writes to his son, he's talking to his son about women, but you better believe that those play both ways, right? It's like God's trying to say, this isn't a little deal. We should be getting through marriage. The dating process, is a, is a, it's a process that we walk through, not a state that we sit in forever. You should go through a dating process as slow as you need to, as quickly as you can as slow as you have to, to evaluate appropriately and as quickly as you can. But evaluation is killed by infatuation. And this is why the church, together, we come alongside those who are making these big decisions and we're not just going, hope they don't blow their lives up. <laughs> well, I found my mate, hopefully you do. It's not the point. We are as a community of believers surrounding one another as a church saying, I want to be here for you. Your relationship with each other is going to be personal for sure, but it's not private. We, the Bible gives us each other as a, as a means of protection. The, proverb, the book of Proverbs says, in an, in an outcropping, in a bunch of counselors, a wise man succeeds, but one who walks alone is a fool who leads to destruction. Would we be a church 
that is loving these people that are in this season and recognize the fight that they're fighting against the cultural expectation of what you should be looking for and pointing them to the scriptural truth of having a bounce to their heart that's better than what GQ magazine says because did you know that he who is faithful and true also loves you. He's not here for your demise or for your sullen, broken, uh, a lifeless obedience. He is, John 10, 10, here to give you life and give it to you abundantly. But you need to have the faith, the confidence that he is gonna do what he says to recognize that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews 11, verse six. Would we trust that in every area of our life, in finances, in relationships, socially, biblically, and even relationally? Would you pray with me? God, we surrender this all to you. We recognize that we are really bad judges sometimes when we're in the middle of infatuation. We get twisted and turned and we're, we're just like someone who can't see straight. And so we as a church wanna come around those. But God, would you also nail these principles deep in our hearts if we're in a season of dating to recognize maybe there's a better list than the one that I've constructed for myself. What if I let the God who wants nothing but my total flourishing and, and full surrender to him be the judge of who gets in and who goes out. Lord, would you be the bouncer of our hearts? We love you. We trust you with everything. In your name we pray, amen. As always, we have a team down here of prayers who want to come and pray with you if that's what you need. If not, we love you, Cornerstone. We'll see you next week.